Hello again, my name is Steve Hillis and we're back for another one of our videos. This one we're going to look at stratification, in particular a famous theory of stratification, Kingsley Davis and Wilbert Moore's functionalist theory of stratification. Davis and Moore's uh, argument uh, eventually reaches the conclusion that social inequality uh, inequalities are necessary, even desirable, in terms of the proper functioning of society. To put it in simple terms, inequality is functional. They claim that inequality benefits almost everyone, rich, middle class, and poor alike. Well, by, you know, if you look at the fate on the face of it, that claim may not strike most people as compelling, but for right now, let's focus more on how they reach this conclusion, because whether the argument holds water or not will depend, I guess, on how they got to that point. So let's look a little bit more at that. Their argument focuses, focuses on the critical role that large, complex, hierarchical organizations play in modern industrialized societies. If I were going to pick one word out of that whole string to stress, it would be hierarchical, or maybe hierarchical organizations. We'll show you a little chart here in a minute, meant to kind of a cartoon version, meant to picture a hierarchical organization, and you'll get a better sense of what we're talking about at that time, I hope. But for right now, just bear with us. We have these big, complicated, complex things we call hierarchical organizations, and they play a critical role in modern societies. These organizations are commonly used to perform a wide a variety of important functions, including economic production and distribution, government, military services, providing mass scale health care, education, charitable activities, and even religion, at least religion, in big organized churches. Hierarchical organizations are a very efficient way to organize social activities. In other words, these organizations, these types of organizations, are functional for the larger society. Uh, without them, maintaining modern living standards might not be possible. Let's take a step back. What are we talking about? Look at the post office, the U.S. military. Look at any large university or any large hospital or any corporation. Look at the U.S. federal government. What do they all share in common? Well, they're all organized into these complex hierarchical uh, structures. In other words, if we were to try to diagram in a very simplified way kind of how an idealized uh, organization of this type might look, it might look something like this. In other words, there, uh, there would be positions at the top of the hierarchy, at the top of the organizations that made most of the decision. These positions, slots, or roles, of course, have to be occupied by real people. Don't get confused. We're not talking about people here. We're talking about organizational positions. And those positions at the top, those are usually the decision makers, the people with the most power, the most authority, the highest status, and the biggest paycheck. But more on that one later. As you move down this organization, uh, generally, uh, infra, uh, pardon me, orders, commands flow downwards. These people make the decisions, and these people follow rules. Information tends to flow up from the bottom up, and these people basically gather up information and then make decisions about everything. What the organization does, how it does it, what kinds of changes have to be made, and so forth and so on. The people at the top basically are the rule makers, the decision makers. They're the ones that make the most important decisions for the larger organization. And then they pass that information down the chain of command. If authority and power and so forth are very high at the top of the organization, it tends to be very low at the bottom. By the time we get to the bottom of the organization, these positions or slots, people who occupy them, frankly, are doing fairly routine, uh, mundane, repetitive kinds of tasks. Uh, they don't make important decisions. Uh, a lot of times they're simply following the rules and commands from those people above them. Uh, a lot of times these jobs have, again, very little authority, very little decision making, very little power, and uh, very little social status, and usually the smallest paychecks. Maybe not always, but usually. So, power, as you move down the uh, organizational chart here, less and less of it, 
less authority, less job status, and usually less decision making and autonomy on the job. Now, of course, this is a very simplified and exaggerated depiction of real world organizations. I doubt any real world organization looks exactly like this. And again, we've probably exaggerated a lot of these tendencies, but nevertheless, when Davis and Moore are talking about hierarchical organizations, generally this is what they're talking about. Now, in order for these hierarchical organizations to work properly, it is necessary that the right types of people, uh, in terms of qualifications, competence, personal characteristics, etc., etc., are selected to fill specific organizational positions or roles. Getting the right people in the right slots is critical. And that's especially true at those top slots because those top slots in the organizations, generally speaking, are more functionally important. If those people screw up their jobs, if they make bad decisions, the entire organization could suffer. It could even be destroyed or fall apart. For example, if you're talking about the Army, really bad decisions by high-level officers could lose a war, could get a lot of people uh, uh, killed. It could even lose a, a, a war altogether. Uh, bad decisions by key corporate executives could lose money for stock uh, uh, holders. It could get a lot of workers fired and ultimately it could drive a company into bankruptcy, so forth and so on. Those top positions tend to come with lots of responsibilities and if those people get those responsibilities wrong, lots of bad things happen, not just to them, but to everybody associated with the organization. On the other hand, people at the bottom end, they screw up their jobs. Well, some bad things happen, problems occur, but usually the scale of those problems are much smaller. We'll return to that in just a little while. For right now, again, the point to emphasize now is you've got to get the right people in the right slot, particularly at the top. Personnel needs to be properly matched with their duties and responsibility. Failure to do so can seriously undermine the larger organization. Getting the wrong kind of people in the wrong slots is wasteful, it's inefficient, it leads to all sorts of problems, and eventually it could lead to catastrophic problems for an organization. Further, it is important to motivate personnel properly so that they can perform their duties effectively. People need to show up to work day after day, year after year. People need to actually invest time and energy to do what they're doing and to do it well and to ultimately do all the things that are necessary to make these complex organizations function properly. We all have to work together. We all have to do our part in the great machine, being cogs in the great machine, getting the great machine to do what it's supposed to do. Positions at the top of large, complex, hierarchical organizations typically require high levels of skills, knowledge, experience, and good work-related character traits. You can't just grab somebody off the street and make them a five-star general, not if you want the military to work right. And the same thing would be true with a university, uh, with high-ranking university uh, 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 positions or high-level positions within a hospital. Uh, obviously, you're talking about people that have all sorts of requirements in terms of skill, background, intelligence, uh, character traits, and so forth. Individuals who possess such traits are fairly rare in the overall population. They must typically undergo extensive preparation in order to earn the necessary qualifications. And they must forgo many things in their lives in order to do so. A lot of times, to be the kind of person that can be groomed and trained to eventually get to the top in these large organizations requires a, a, a large chunk of your youth and maybe even your middle age just to be prepared to be qualified. It's about kids not going uh, to parties, not screwing around, not getting pregnant, not getting married, kids getting good grades, kids basically uh, foregoing a social life beginning uh, you know, fairly early in life and working their tails off for years and years and years to even be qualified to compete for those positions. And once they're on the job, they often work very long hours, experience lots of stress, and are constantly required to make difficult choices. You may have to shut a plant down or fire people. You may have to pe put people in harm's way if you're uh, you know, a military officer and so forth. These are tough choices. The bottom line is, is these can be very rough jobs. How do you motivate people to do it? 
properly motivating them requires lots of material and non-material rewards, according to Davis and Moore. Of course, you may bribe them with money, lots of money. But you may also reward them with uh, all sorts of symbolic or non-material rewards, status rewards, fancy titles, a, a really nice uh, view out the office window, and that sort of thing. But basically, whether you're using material or non-material rewards, you're trying to motivate these people to invest uh, uh, basically their lives into doing these important jobs well.